All right, welcome to Keep On Rolling. A look inside the American trucking industry. Yours truly, Graham Bradley. My computer is nine years old. It's going to take a minute to move between slides whenever I click it, so. Watch me skip this one. So, I'm an author, I'm an illustrator, a truck driver, a podcaster. I just recently started my own podcast this year with uh, the Anchor platform. I do a, it's called the Brother Trucker Book Club. I talk about books that I've read and listened to while I was out on the road. These are my books if you guys want to look at them later when we're all done. But uh, most of all, I'm, I've just got a lot of stories. Some of them are the stories that I cooked up for my books. Others are adventures that I picked up out in the different jobs that I've been doing since I, was, since I got my CDL about six years ago. And we're going to get into the different sides of that. We're going to talk about rules of the trucking industry, upcoming changes, whether on the tech side or the legal side, and adventures that I have had along the way. The quote that you're going to hear a lot from truckers is that if you've got it, a truck brought it. Everything you have. Clothes were brought to the department stores by truckers. Construction materials for every building you've been in was moved by a truck at some point. Port and rail are still important, but all the in-between stuff, the flexibility is, is going to be on three or so five axles. That's how they're going to transport it to you. Transporting goods, materials, and labor is a central feature of an economy's ability to spread and thrive. So, if you're designing a game or a book or a story, you got to think about logistics. How do things get to where they are? If you're back in the 1800s, ox cart and wagon. The fuel is whatever you can feed the ox. Engine breaks down, it happens when the ox dies, or, or breaks a leg, or the horse throws a shoe, or something. So moving things is, is central to uh, expansion. In terms of the modern industry today, there are 3.5 million drivers with a Class A CDL in America. That's just over 1% of the population. That does not include Class B drivers, which is also a CDL you can get, but for straight truck vehicles and for buses, for anything more than, with more than 15 passengers. And in all 50 states, a driver is the most common occupation, although that also includes non-commercial driving. And uh, now with the, with the popularity of Lyft and Uber and other, other rideshare uh, applications, that's going to become more common. You want to go get the door, so I'm going to pull off. Thank you for doing that. Trucking is an expensive and heavily regulated industry. Aside from the ever-fluctuating cost of diesel fuel, truckers are also subject to state taxes, local taxes, federal taxes, and registration fees wherever they want to operate. Depending on what you haul and where, your annual bill for these fees could be staggering. And whenever a new tax, fee, or regulatory cost gets imposed on the trucking industry, that cost is then passed on to the consumer. Imagine that, truckers still want to make money. This raises the cost of the transportation service. And that shrinks the profit margins for drivers over the last several decades because they can only raise the, the price of their goods so much. This reduces the incentive to enter the industry and become a truck driver, or a dispatcher, or a safety manager, or a branch manager, or a supervisor. All of these things affect a section of the workforce where fewer people want to do the work, yet our constantly moving economy is not reducing the demand. We'll get into what some of these uh, permits and pieces of paperwork are. And even with all of this scrutiny and oversight, lawmakers are still imposing stricter standards on drivers and carriers. Recently, the Fed began a partial rollout of a law requiring electronic modules in every semi-truck to track the movement, and the hours of operation. It used to be uh, you would track your own logs on paper, and that was a trucker's favorite form of time travel, just keeping multiple logbooks. <laughs> this used to be done with a combination of paper and the honor system, which led to mixed results. It's a staple of trucking culture that drivers treat their pens and logs as time machines. Many experienced truckers will have kept two or three sets of books for a stretch of time in their career. 
one for their employer, one for the DOT, and occasionally one for themselves, although I personally don't see why you would keep a log of the actual illegal hours that you've been operating, because that's just, here's how to arrest me if you find this book, you know. But the new electronic modules can't be cheated, and there's a couple of reasons why that matters. This is a driver's daily hour log. Truckers are limited by how many hours they can work and drive in a single day. For example, starts at midnight, ends at midnight. If you start your day at 6 a.m., that's when you go from the off-duty line to the on-duty line, you have until 8 p.m. before you have to go back off-duty for the rest of the day. You have a 14-hour window from the time you start to the time that you have to finish. Now, you're not always gonna work a 14-hour day, so you work a regular eight-hour day, you go off-duty at two, you're not allowed to go back on duty for 10 hours. That will reset your 14-hour clock. Otherwise, you're still within that window. Say so you go back off to do another run or something at 6 p.m., you still have to finish by eight. And within that 14-hour window, you can only drive a maximum of 11 hours. So 14 hours total on duty, including driving hours, but 11 of those hours can be driving hours. What does that say, sleeper? Sure. Yeah, it says a sleeper berth, um, and, and they keep those four lines on every driver's log, but not every truck has a sleeper berth in it. This is primarily for long-haul drivers, um, and that's you, you track your off-duty hours differently from your sleeper berth hours because they're still logging that you are in the truck. But you have to be, you know, sleeper berth or off-duty together counts as, as the same thing. But if uh, you say that you're, you're home for the weekend, you're not actually out actually on the road, you wouldn't mark yourself in the sleeper berth even if you're sleeping in your own bed, you would mark yourself as off-duty. And that would, that would count towards resetting your hours for the day. It's, it can be a complex formula, especially when you consider that you know, these marks here are half hour, these marks are 15 minutes, you're gonna mark it 25, 50, 75, whatever, and you gotta add up each, um, each line at the end of the day and then get your sum total. It has to come out to 24 hours every time. You gotta add it on here on the side and keep track of your hours in the last seven day window because you can only work 70 total hours in a week. If you hit if you hit beyond 70, you gotta stop and be shut down for 34 hours. That's a 24 hour period plus a 10 hour window on top. What if you hit 70 but you're still like on the road in the middle? You gotta of the shut down. So you just pull over and go to sleep. Yep. Pull over or wait wait for your, your 34 hour reset. Or what you can do is you can stop for 10 hours and then the last day drops off of your eight day window. Or the first day of your of your seven or eight day stretch. Well, you said seven hours, 70 hours a week, you mean eight days then? It's, it's 70 and eight, yeah. It, it's, it can be, some. if you're local, it's different. Sometimes it's, it's 60 and seven days, or if it's 70 and eight days. Okay, eight days then. So they're, they're screwing, they, they, they get screwed with you sometimes. Eight, on eight day, that's confusing as hell. In, in an eight day period. In the last eight days, you can, yeah. So. And then the confusion of it is something that, like, we spent a lot of time on this when I was in trucking school, then we tried to, to really drill into your head how this works. And that's part of the reason why they're pushing towards the electronic box, because it come, computes all that stuff for you. And it will tell you, hey, you've only got 11 hours left on your 70 for the week, so you can only drive so far today. You've got to know, okay, well, maybe I'll just wait until tomorrow, and then I'll get a fresh 70, and I can work for another week without any uh, impediment. you're going to be probably disappointed that the tanker is not actually carrying coffee. Oh. Time management is a huge issue for drivers because the timing of the work doesn't always line up with the requirements of the law. This can throw a trucker's sleep cycle off pretty fast and sleep deprivation is a major problem for drivers. There's a reason truck stops serve up millions of gallons of coffee and energy drinks every year. You uh, go to any flying Do you, you mind questions as you're going? No, absolutely. Okay. Um, the thought that occurred there is uh, and you might get to this, um, are there um, excessive numbers of accidents because of the sleep deprivation? We are going to talk about that, yeah. So okay. it, and that's something that, that the Fed has really been cracking down on in the last five to ten years. And, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment because there are a lot of guys that, and this is kind of compounded by people who keep multiple logs and they'll try to drive more than 11 hours a day because drivers aren't paid by the hour, they're paid by the mile. So you try to drive as much as you can but if you're trying to make a certain amount of money, then the 11 hour window limits that. So it, is the 70 hours per eight days, is that pretty standard? That's federal, so yeah, it's, 
and it, it comes from the DOT, Federal Department of Transportation, and uh, all 50 states comply with that, as far as I know. At least the lower 48, I never drove to Alaska. But yeah, getting strung out on caffeine is a major problem for a lot of these drivers because the crash ends up being pretty hard. The long haul carrier that I worked for was Night Transportation. They had a two day orientation for new drivers, explaining how to work the computers and the trucks and so forth. They also had a section about sleep deprivation and the effects of caffeine on the brain. So this was a, a, a company that was taking the initiative to, to teach this to the drivers instead of just, okay, here's what the loss is you have to do. They were saying like, no, this is what actually happens to your body and your brain when you get messed up on this stuff for too long. It's a serious enough and common enough issue that it gets a lot of attention from companies and the government alike. So some of this stuff is, is stuff that companies can tell that the government's gonna be making an issue of it down the road, and so they're, they're trying to get ahead of it and make it part of their standard practice just to, to keep drivers from getting too messed up on this stuff. This particular issue even entered into the national consciousness a few years ago when a tired Walmart driver fell asleep behind the wheel and ended up rear-ending a celebrity comedian, Tracy, Tracy Morgan. This happens several times a year to average Joes, but when it's somebody famous, obviously it gets more attention and that kind of accelerated things on the, on the federal scale with them wanting to implement this law that, that really from, you know, gives companies more oversight over their vehicles and allows them to have greater control and greater knowledge of when their truckers are trying to, to drive beyond their hours. Because that driver did fall asleep behind the wheel and he ended up, you, you can look at the pictures online, but Tracy Morgan was in like a big old van with his entire family. And that truck rammed it and rammed it into another vehicle and munched the whole side of it on the driver's side. He was in critical condition for a couple of days. It was it was a pretty bad deal. So avoiding drowsy driver accidents is one of the reasons the DOT is forcing the entire industry to change from paper logs to digital logs. This has upsides and downsides. So we cover the downsides first. For one, there is no such thing as a cheap government law. Big and small companies both have to invest in the tech to upgrade their fleet. They have to have a module installed in every one of the vehicles, and then they have to pay for the service to monitor it. Qualcomm is the, the big name that you'll see associated with that. There's another one that I can't remember the name of. It started with a K. It was like a five-letter company. They, they use software on the Android OS platform, so they're paying for licensing on that, and then they're paying for uh, tech support and off-site monitoring that will then feed data in real time to the, the trucker's uh, terminal to the dispatch office so that they know exactly where the vehicles are at all time. And, the dispatchers will get a warning when the trucker is coming up on his hours, or if the trucker hits his brakes too hard, or if he's speeding in his own, or you know, there's there's a lot of control that it gives the company, but control is big brother type thing. But uh, so yeah, the, the cost of that can really affect a smaller company disproportionately to a large one. So it's it's going to be uh, so they have to actually pay the government as well. They have to pay, so the, the law says that they have to buy uh, a module in the service. Or they have to pay another company. So they gotta pay, they gotta pay the company. It, it, it works pretty well if you're the company selling the, the right. onboard computer and the, the digital logs in the service. So you're not, you don't have to buy it from the government, but if you don't okay. buy it and they, and they catch you, they find you and then you have to buy it anyway. And there's multiple ones they can buy. Yeah, there's, there's a few competitors you know, out there, but Qualcomm's gonna be the biggest one. Another one of the drawbacks of this is it really chokes an individual trucker's flexibility. Again, the timing of the work doesn't necessarily meet up with the rule of law. When I was driving for night, I used to run loads up into Canada where the electronic module didn't get coverage at the time. Qualcomm stopped working right at the 54th parallel. Oh my. Because they didn't have coverage in Canada. Thanks. So when I was out of the country, I had to keep my time on paper logs and then turn them in with the loads that I was running. Uh, there was one particular load that I had to run up to Edmonton, and I only had a couple of paper logs in the truck. And uh, on my very last day, I had to cover a distance of 500 miles to go from Edmonton back to uh, Bonners Ferry, Idaho, so I could get back in the country and be legal with my timekeeping. Despite me planning my whole day around this, the shipper took too long to get me loaded and then overloaded my truck by 3,000 pounds. So I had to go back and tell him, hey, you got to take a couple of bundles off of this. And, uh, I ended up being behind on my schedule by two to two and a half hours. Now, this particular year, 2013, they also ruled out an, or ruled, ruled out an additional rule where you had to, within the first eight hours of your 14-hour window, take a 30-minute break. So you had to stop what you were doing, you know, slow down your workflow, 
and just sit there for 30 minutes and the computer would check if you were doing it or not. But oh my gosh. I was, I, yeah. was uh, I was in the black on that. I, I was like, right. I don't know why that isn't happening in the, because I work in uh, insulation. And I remember one of the warehouses I used to work for, uh, they also had that 30 minute break thing. But insulation now, we just have a 30 minute lunch that's federally mandated, but we still don't. And they'll, and they'll treat that the same, you know, and, and drivers will usually take their lunch on their 30. Okay. But, you know, and you can, you can count it the same. It doesn't have to just be like, you know, oh, you, you, you randomly have to stop in this place and do it. But they, they do require you to take the break now. Well, because I wasn't, I was able to uh, just write down on my paperwork that I had taken the break and that I had started on time. I hammered down from Edmonton to Bonners Ferry to still make it within my window because the the time that I had started was on the paperwork from the from the, uh, the customer, so I couldn't change that time of my start on the log. So I had to like, okay, I've got to make 500 miles in uh, in just under 11 hours, and there are parts of that that highway in you know, south of Calgary that slow down a little bit. So I I hammered down, kept it pretty close to the speed limit the entire way, and I did not stop until I got to the border. My butt didn't leave that chair until Bonner's Ferry. But I wrote down on the paperwork that, yeah, I started at this time, I took my break here, blah, 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 because I had that flexibility. Um, now that electronic logs work outside the country, they fix that glitch, drivers will no longer have that option, and that is a downside, because that would have caused me to stay an extra day in Calgary, and then I would have been a day late to my next pickup, and I would have ultimately made less money that week that month. As a driver, you don't have to help unload, right? That's all on the ninety-five percent of the dry van freight that we do is no touch. Oh, okay. But there were some some loads that I had to do, and I would get a bonus for getting out and unload. Like uh, there was there was a company in Lather, California, that did carpet padding, and they would ship their rolls to you know four or five different suppliers at a time. So they would put this customer is at the front of your truck, and then the next batch is next, and so on and so forth. And I get an extra twenty dollars every time I got out and helped unload. But your, your job doesn't require that you be able to lift a certain amount, does it? They'll, they'll do a lift test, they'll do a physical test. It depends on the carrier that you work for, but like I said, 95% of the touch is no freight, and if you've got some sort of physical limitation to where you, you couldn't do that, you would let them know and they wouldn't put you on one of those loads. They would let somebody else carry it. But, but again, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the extra 100 bucks for offloading at all the sites. Yeah, so they, they, they try to compensate as much as they can. Now the upside to that, you guys guess how I feel about IKEA? I see that I laugh. Mm, that's good. These modules will keep a trucker from being victimized by a dishonest dispatcher, which has also happened to me. Hmm. I, I feel like there's a connection here, but I'm not yeah. quite getting it. Dispatchers and driver managers are in charge of keeping loads moving at all times, but sometimes they will sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, just lean up on a driver to get moving even when they don't have the hours yet. And when I was in Canada, because they knew that the Qualcomm's didn't work there, I had a little SOB dispatcher who, I would call him and tell him, I was like, okay, I've still got six hours left on my 10 hour window and I've got to do, you know, I gotta get this much sleep. And he'd call me after four hours, like, hey, can you get moving yet? And I'm like, you know what the answer is. <laughs> But he's like, man, we gotta get going, you gotta get going, you gotta get so going. So the dispatcher's kind of like the air traffic controllers. Yeah, uh, and he's the one that would send you the load information. The problem was, if he was calling me on my phone, it was because it was for something that he didn't want sent over the computer. That Because that was traceable, and I didn't know that until after the fact. I was still a new driver when he was doing this. Nice. IKEA. IKEA. <laughs> they only take loads between 1 and 5 in the morning. So even if I get there the night before, I still have to wake up and interrupt my sleep when it's time to back up the truck to the dock. They'll come and they'll pound on the door of your truck, hey, take dock number two, and it's, they give you very little room to maneuver. I, I freaking hate IKEA. This deprives me physically of the rest that I need, even if the computer thinks the truck hasn't moved. I frequently explained to my dispatcher that I still had two, four, and six hours left on my window, etc. He would say, yeah, cool, and then call me two hours later, pretending that I needed to be on the road to pressure me to get going. From where he was sitting, the records could be fudged, and he didn't care that I was sleep deprived. But even if the digital records said that the truck hadn't moved, because you can move a certain distance before the computer kicks on, mm -hmm. and if you keep it under a certain speed, the computer won't kick on. So it would still show that, I, that the truck hadn't moved, but that didn't change the fact that I was sleep deprived. And he wanted me, you know, pounded out another 400 miles that day. With electronic monitoring, <clears throat> especially one that works in all of North America, Drivers can tell their dispatchers to get bent. I really, really wish I had that power at the time. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the time commitment involved in this job. 
Truckers are usually gone for an average of two weeks at a time. This can vary. For me, I would spend about five days a month at home on a good month. My company's policy was seven days on to earn one day off. They need to have trucks everywhere so they can grab loads anywhere, and the only way to make that work is to keep you out on the road. It's just the nature of the work. I had a bad stretch where I was gone for about a month and a half. Seven days on and one day off? You would, you would be out on the road for, for seven days, and that would earn you one, one day off. So if you were out for two weeks, and they routed you back home, you say, okay, don't call me for two days, I'm not gonna answer the phone, I'm gonna be out with my family. So yeah, a week on, a day off. That's crazy. Yep, it's brutal. It's the nature of the work though. Because of the cost of fuel and the, and the availability of, of jobs and the scheduling that they, that they do, excuse me, it's not, it's not possible for them to guarantee that you'll be back on a certain day unless they have you on a dedicated route. And those are rare enough that they hold on to them and they reward uh, they're loyal drivers with those jobs, and, and that's why it's, it's kind of hard to get on one of those gigs. There's a UPS route from Las Vegas to Beaver and back, a, a dedicated route where drivers will haul like two or three trailers from the, the train stations at Las Vegas up to a, a terminal in Beaver. And from what I understand, that, that job is really, really coveted. Like there are guys that will get that and they'll hold on to it for like 10 years because the money's good. The stability is good. They'll be there and back in Vegas every single day. For truckers, that's gold. Yeah, I, I plus have, the benefits package at UPS. I have a friend who drives every day from like Salt Lake to um, Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. and, and so he's back. on a dedicated route and back. But he all he gets it's like a regular job: five days on, two days off. Mm -hmm. So so is he. Colorado Springs, the distance there. So does he like go spend the night and come back? No, no, he does there back on the same day. Yeah, yeah, and that that'll be a dedicated route then. It's not local, so a local route is defined as they they figure out where your home base is, where your terminal is, and then they give you a hundred mile radius from there. So if you go beyond that, you have to keep logs. If not, if you're just in town, you don't have to keep driver logs on that. That's that's a, a local route. So he's far enough that he would still have to keep logs. But it's it's a dedicated route if he knows that he's just got to go there, drop off, come back. But that's just that's a good job because that's a great job because you don't have that that seven day one day thing. Mm -hmm. And that was just the company that, that I worked for. Some of them will you know, might be trying to change that again to um, to lure more drivers in. So what did you call those kind of jobs? The ones that are um, a set route, dedicated routes. Yeah. And then the kind of job that I did was called OTR over the road. Where you spent most of your time out, and they would, there was a job that would pick up in your hometown, and they'd say, "Okay, you're going to go to Pico Rivera, California." You go there, and they'd say, "Okay, the next closest one that I can find is 20 miles away in Fontana. Go pick it up there. That one's going to take you up the five to Lathrop. Okay, you're in Lathrop. Go get a load of carpet rolls. That's going to have five drop-offs in Oregon and Washington. So you're going to stay on the five and work your way up." And they just find you jobs close to wherever you are so that you're not running empty too far from one job to the next. Because the company still has to pay you for empty miles, but the company's not getting paid for empty miles. So, you know, that's, that's the logistical side of it. They, the, the, the money kind of determines everything. You know, because they, they've got to go off of what they can get paid off of, and that's just that's the nature of... of so a local, a local driver is on a normal schedule, too. Yeah, and, and right. right now I'm a local driver. I have been for about five years. I only did uh, I only did OTR for about eight months. I got out of it as fast as I could because uh, I got into trucking kind of out of necessity. My, my oldest son, pictured here, uh, he was born, and about two weeks later I lost my job. I was working at a, at a sign shop. <laughs> And, you know, my wife couldn't, we didn't want to have to work and put our son into daycare, you know, we wanted her to be able to stay home. And so I went to trucking school, I got my license in a month, and I went out OTR, and it was, it was the fastest way. OTR on the road. Oh, yeah. And it was, it's, it was, I mean, OTR is, is another, it, it's just another way of saying long haul, same kind of work. But it was the fastest way to get me kind of in the 40,000 a year tax bracket and make the kind of money that we needed to where she wouldn't have to work and all that stuff. This this picture here was, uh, I was on a run from, <coughs> excuse me, I had a load that I picked up somewhere in California and I stopped at our terminal in Las Vegas, where, where I'm from, and uh, she came by with our son and our dog and you know, we, we hung out for my 30 and, and for dinner and then you know, we took a quick picture and then said goodbye and I had to run up and be in Beaver by the end of the night. 
And so you, you, you take what moments you can get. You know, it, usually if I, was, if I was able to schedule some kind of layover in Las Vegas, I'd call and go like, hey, tomorrow I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, take my 30 there, or I could stretch it to you know, an hour or two if, if possible. Um, you know, based on my 14 hour window, I said, well, if I only shut down the St. George, then I'll, I'll still be okay. It's, it's the kind of juggling act that you have to do. It's definitely, definitely a job for a single man. I, I met a lot of guys that, that loved the work and got divorced a lot because, imagine that, you gotta be there for the time of your marriage. So this right here, some, some people believe we can stay out longer than the seven days or the, the two weeks or whatever. There's some people that will straight up live on the road. You see a big old truck like this, uh, that's beyond a sleeper berth. That's like a rolling apartment. Uh, those trucks are expensive. They'll, they'll very easily come in at $250,000, $300,000. So the cost trucker cost. owns that part of that, its own? That'll be a, an owner-operator rig. The, the trucker will own the entire rig. Okay. And then he'll, he might even own his own trailer, or he'll be able to, to broker loads where he's moving somebody else's trailer for them, and he'll have to carry insurance that covers that. And definitely a lot of paperwork involved. <laughs> And on that subject, different types of drivers. So the, the simplest one, the one that's like the fast food of trucking, is the company driver. That's the, the one that's the easiest to get into. You have very low liability, but your income is, I mean, you, they'll, they'll tell you, oh yeah, you'll make $40,000 in your first year. And like, yeah, and you'll make it every year after that. Like there's really not a whole lot of upward mobility in being a company driver. You're, you're basically moving just uh, you know, typical 53-foot drive-in trailers and, and bumping docks for low pay. Then you can go up and be an owner-operator, you get a higher liability, but there's much higher income. To give you an example, the company that I worked for would pay between 30 and 40 cents a mile. Um, if you were on a shorter run, like if they would send you a job and say, okay, this job is only 200 miles, and that job would be 40 cents a mile. But if they gave you a job that was 400, 500 miles, that would be closer to 32, 31 cents a mile, but it still comes out to way more because of, of the volume. If they only paid you 31 cents a mile, no matter what, nobody would want to take the short jobs because you can't live off of that. So they, they make the pay scale according to what they can afford to pay you and what you can afford to live on. Uh, so if you're a company driver, you'll get that 30 cents a mile, but if you're an owner operator, the company will pay you $1.30 a mile because you are also paying off a truck. And then you'll you'll charge a fuel surcharge to the uh, the shipper, so that whatever you end up paying for fuel, they pay you back for it. Things like that. So you, you're you're taking on a lot more liability as an owner operator, which you're making a lot more money. You pay off that truck in about two or three years, and then you own a truck. You get the equity back out of it. The reason why the companies want you to be an owner operator is it reduces their overhead. The company then doesn't have to have a quarter of a million dollar loan on the books for one truck. They, they can get the truckers to do that and the trucker owns the truck when it's done. Now there are some companies that have been found kind of shafting their drivers and ended up in class action lawsuits because they would find some fireable offense for the driver about three or four months before the truck was paid off. And okay, you're fired and we're keeping the truck and you paid off most of it. Swift and Werner got busted for that a couple of times. Werner especially, their business model is, is more based on them being a used truck dealer who also ships. Mm. So they, they ended up in a class action over that and had to pay a lot of drivers. Dry van, that's the, the basic kind, 53 foot closed trailer that hauls most things. That'll be your 95% your no touch freight. The driver will just back up to the dock and then he'll be sitting there for an hour. 53 hour. foot long? The trailer is 53 okay. foot long. I was imagining yeah. 53 feet high. No, like, no, no. What the <laughs> hell? Max height on the dry van is, is 13.5, and then they have what's called a high cube trailer that's slightly narrower and it's six inches taller. Okay. The reason why you need to know your height is for bridges. Overhead clearance. Yeah. And you cannot take a, a high cube into Canada. They have too many bridges that are too low. Mm. You're sitting there doing math, trying to figure out, okay, what's what's four comma three in standard, blah, blah, blah. It's like, holy crap, that bridge is only 13.8 high, and I've got a 13.6 trailer. And I'm glad it's the summertime, so there's no snowpack on the ground that would give you an extra two inches. So, reefer, or is a refrigerated unit? Um, I had a friend who dro drove reefer. He hated it because uh, there's, a, there's a monitor on the front of the trailer that tells when the temperature is raising to a certain level, then that reefer engine will kick on and refrigerate it back down to a certain level. The problem is that reefer engine is right at the front of the trailer, right up against the back of your truck, and it'll kick on three or four times a night. 
and a, an unmuffled diesel engine kicking on two feet away from you with about that much metal to insulate, it's pretty loud. And so basically you, wear earmuffs? Yeah, you, yeah, you pretty much have to. Flatbed, uh, you'll get a lot more money as a flatbed driver because they'll pay you an extra $20 to tarp the load, an extra $20 to untarp the load. Um, they, they just get paid more per mile just generally. My friend who did the reefer for, for Swift, he got out of that and went to go work for Melton and he was, you know, like, yeah, I think it was like a 50% pay increase, like right away. But the flatbed guys, same thing, like finding flatbed work is even farther apart than finding dry van work. So he had to stay out like four weeks at a time minimum. But he didn't have a family or anything, it worked for him, he liked it, it fit his lifestyle. So again, you find guys that are basically living out on the road and then he'll, he'll work you know, four or five weeks on and earn a week and a half off. And you know, he ended up moving all of his stuff to his mom's house in Tennessee and he's like, screw it, you know, I don't need a rent payment, bank most of what he makes. Do that for four or five years, go buy a chunk of land, and then do whatever else he wants to do after that. Mm. Heavy haul is very specialized. I worked with a couple of guys that were heavy haulers, and uh, yeah, I mean, you gotta know a lot about this particular piece of equipment, how you can balance it, where so you those can those oversized it. loads? Yeah, they're usually the, the big oversized loads. Um, it's, it'll be a, a slow burn, but you get high pay to do it because there's a lot of burnout. Again, there's a lot of liability, a lot of paperwork, a lot of stuff that you have to know. Are those the ones where they'll, do they always have uh, spotters following them? Chase trucks. Well? Yeah, sometimes like you can hire a pilot car service. Uh, sometimes it'll be you know the company that you work for. I'm trying to remember now the name of the company that was in Vegas that did heavy haul. They had their own you know pilot car service, like in-house employees that would do that. Okay. Uh, I had to do a, a, an oversized haul one time. It wasn't heavy. It was just huge. Okay. And we, we called up a, a pilot service and they sent a truck that would drive you know between a quarter of a mile and a half a mile ahead of me with a with a height pole. And if I saw that pole hit anything, I had to stop and say, okay, we got to figure out a way around, whether it's a bridge or a power line or something, because obviously if I hit it with a silo, I'm going to damage the silo or damage the whatever it is. Uh -huh. um, solo driving, where it's just you, the road, your favorite tunes, audiobooks, whatever you want to listen to. Again, that goes back to being a company driver, whether you're driving, van, reefer, flatbed, versus being a team driver. The thing about being a team driver, and I only did this once or twice, is you've got to be pretty good friends with whoever you're driving with because you are living in the size of a closet and anything that you do that pisses them off or vice versa is going to get amplified in that space. Uh, I did it when I was training, especially. The, the plus side of that is that a, a team truck almost never stops running. Because if you've got 11 hours and your co-driver has 11 hours, that truck can run most of the day. You can cover 6,000 miles in a week. You can start in California and be in New York on Wednesday in California. But you have to Saturday. split the, the money, right? What's that? But you're splitting the money, right? But they're, they're paying two drivers. Oh, they are paying yeah, for both drivers. It's not drivers. like you're, okay. they're, like, no, like the, the, the pay is higher and everything, but because again, it's, it's hard to find two people that want to do that. And you're finding a lot of uh, retirees that are going into it, husband and wife, they'll both get their CDLs and say, hey, oh, let's do this nice. for a couple of years. So you can, <laughs> again, you, if, you, if your utilities are low, you don't have a power bill, you don't have a water bill, you just gotta buy your, your groceries, cover your, your medical and your own personal insurance and all that stuff, and you don't have rent or a mortgage, heck yeah. You know, the two of you, you can pull down a hundred grand in a year. Husband and wife, or husband, husband, or wife, wife. 21st whatever, century, right? yeah. I mean, you, 2019 yeah. nowadays, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag rainbows, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you can get whatever you want. These, you know, whatever two people that can get along well enough to not kill each other when one of them's you know, in the sleeper berth. It's just one of you's going to have to be the nighttime driver, so. All right. There are a lot of incentives that companies are throwing at people to try to get them to come work for them. Uh, these are all things that have been offered to me. So when I started working for Knight, uh, I, I chose them over other companies because they were offering a higher cent per mile. And uh, the, the benefits package was a little bit better. It didn't kick in right away, but basically the, the pay was higher. And I, I talked to a couple of guys who had worked there and said, yeah, you know, it, it was better than going with, with Swift or Werner. And then uh, I got out and they've tried to get me back a couple of times. They recently sent me an email we're saying, that, hey, we've got a special thing going where if we if we rehire drivers that have worked for us and left, we'll give you a fifteen thousand dollar re-signing bonus. And they break it up over the course of a year, so technically, after a year, you're getting a pay cut. But like, they're they're really really trying hard to to get and retain drivers. They'll they'll also have a quarterly bonus system that'll be tied to good fuel mileage, passing safety inspections. If you stop at a company terminal, they'll do an inspection on the exterior and interior of the truck to make sure that 
you're living clean, you're taking care of it, all that stuff. And if you, if you hit those perks and get the truck serviced on time, you can make an extra thousand dollars a quarter. You know, so they, they make it worth your while to be on top of things. Sometimes they also fudge things and you end up losing an entire bonus because of like, well, you didn't get the, the truck serviced on time. It's like, yeah, I told my dispatcher he didn't drop me to a terminal and put me out on another run. And I you know, missed my, my oil change by 1,800 miles and here I am. So those kind of things can, can piss you off. Uh, Pride, they're a company based up in West Valley City. I would absolutely never work for them. I've heard too many horror stories. Somehow they got my phone number, and every year or so they call me and say, hey, you know, we, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this. They were offering a brand new truck with a microwave and a refrigerator, which are not standard, and then they were going to give me a year of NFL Game Pass and satellite TV and like a three to $5,000 sign-on bonus, and the truck was also going to have Wi-Fi. None of that stuff is standard. It's all like exceptionally sweet, sweet cheddar that to they're tossing on the top of it. But even if it was a different company that wasn't a company that I heard too many bad things about, I, as a married man with two kids and, and a wife that I want to take care of and keep in my life for you know many, many years to come, would not go back out of the road even for that. If a fifteen thousand dollars sign-on bonus plus the fifty thousand dollars a year that I could make wasn't going to do it, this is going to do it either. But the point is. Companies are so hard up for drivers, but they're throwing a lot of good stuff at, at people to come and do it. And uh, it's hard to get and retain reliable people who can do the work. So let's talk about why people wouldn't take all that sweet stuff in the piles of cash and everything. It takes a certain kind of person to be a long haul truck driver. Usually it's people who need the money. Sometimes it's people who like the, the seclusion. People don't really aspire to it on the large. They, they do it because they have to. And again, that's kind of why I ended up being a long hauler to begin with, and that's why I tried to get out of it so quickly, is because I wanted to see my kid grow up. You know, I wanted to spend more time with my wife. I didn't have a smartphone until I became a truck driver because, you know, call me a Luddite or whatever, I didn't really want to have one, but I wanted to be able to, to send videos to my wife. I wanted to be able to FaceTime with her. I wanted to be able to see her more than twice a month. And, and that's the kind of stresses that can land on a driver. Trip planning is another aspect of it. It used to be that you would have to keep a, a general continental, like lower 48 road atlas in your truck. And then if you were gonna be working in certain areas, you'd have to keep pretty much a library of road atlases in your truck, which increases the weight. Or whenever your dispatcher called you on the phone and gave you a load, you'd have to write down the directions and make sure that you followed it to a T to get to where you're going. Two minutes? Okay. Yeah, I would now, just say you had 15, so. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, you're, uh, you, you uh, can buy a, a diesel GPS that will factor in all the, the size and weight and everything in your truck, and it won't route you on a road that you can't go on and things like that. Wow. It's made it a lot simpler. And uh, I had to buy my own unit. It was $300. I still have it. Now that they're putting these fancier electronic modules in the trucks, they come with this stuff equipped. Is that better than like what your phone can do? Uh, it doesn't take data, so yes. Oh. And the, the signal is more reliable. Oh, okay. You don't end up out in the middle of somewhere where spring screws you over and says, I don't think you're actually there. Staying healthy on the road. You gotta buy the right food, you gotta understand your, that your caloric needs are lower since you're pretty much gonna be sitting down all day. Eat sunflower seeds, eat fruits, and so forth. Drink your fluids, but don't overhydrate because every time you have to stop that truck, you're technically losing money. You want to keep it running at a higher speed. Truckers get very good at peeing in bottles while they are driving. If you ever pass the truck on the highway, there's a good chance at some point you were next to a driver who was relieving himself into a Gatorade bottle at high speed. <laughs> Uh, you can you can plan your food, plan your meals, budget it really well, uh, invest in a cooler, be smart with what you buy. 40 to 50 bucks a week can keep you healthy and full, you don't end up looking like this guy. In terms of the future of the industry, automation is set to solve a lot of the problems that companies have with finding drivers, but also to disrupt a lot of the work for the drivers that do actually want to do it. There are things that it can do and can't do, and there's a lot to, to come down the road. The question for employers is about cost effectiveness. You'll reach a point where it's cheaper to buy an analog truck and employ a human than it is to buy a robot truck. Then the robot trucks will get cheaper, and you'll have to consider what parts of the job a human can do. Going back to flat bedding, we're talking about strapping the load, securing it, balancing it, tying it in a certain way. Evaluating the exterior, accurately reading signs, adjusting the inclement weather. 
Um, it's going to be a lot like when they introduced ATMs at banks. People thought it was going to completely wipe out the teller industry, and instead it ended up expanding banking, and tellers ended up learning new skills, becoming loan officers, things like that. I don't think it's going to be as easy a transition when we go fully automated on trucks. They're going to automate as much as they can. Um, for me, I, I foresee in the future kind of like a, a hybrid role, role where there will still be a human who can get out and make judgment calls and do the things that it would be too expensive for a, a robot to do, but they'll automate a lot of the stuff that is hazardous, you know, the, the oh, speeding and stuff like that. Uh, local work is going to be less so to might the driver. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll tie up real fast here. Well, so might the driver in the future be regulated maybe to like a kind of driver <coughs> helper? In a sense, he'll be riding shotgun or sitting in a sleeping berth, things like that. Um, and there, there are specialized forms of local work, things that I have done working with cranes, working hazmat, uh, equipment rental, things like that, that'll, that'll be less susceptible to being disrupted by automation. Uh, last note here, um, I would recommend that if somebody really wants to do it, uh, that they go to a college or a trade school if they're still planning to do so, choose a major that will be valuable to them to get a career, then take a year or two off and then grind it out on the road. You know, bank most of what you make, keep your expenses low, kill your student loan debt, and at the same time perform a vital economic function, gain experience, listen to a boatload of audiobooks and podcasts, and see the country. And uh, I, I think that would solve a lot of the financial problems that young people are having with you know, getting into college, wrecking up a ton of debt, learning nothing that's useful or valuable out in the, in the skills market, and then all of a sudden they're unemployed and there's still plenty of work that needs to be done to keep the economy moving. Uh, you know, supplement one thing with another and, and understand that it's not going to be you know, permanent. I'm not going to be a trucker forever. I'm actually looking to get into, be getting into the tech side of things, but it has given me a very comfortable life for the last six years, and it will for anybody else who wants to put the time to do it. Mm -hmm.